host. As we begin this evening, I want to make an acknowledgement of the land. It is a traditional custom of Indigenous people when welcoming others to their land and into their homes. By acknowledging the land, we honor the original people of this territory. We live, work and play on the traditional territories that have been home to many Indigenous peoples from time immemorial and continues to be the home of many Indigenous peoples today. This evening, we welcome you to this celebration from this place called Mokinstis the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kaina, and Pikani, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nation, and the Métis Nation Region 3. We know that many of you are coming from other traditional lands and hope you'll recognize them too. We acknowledge that these peoples who have lived, worked, played, and stewarded this land it is on their history and on their legacy that we continue to build history today. We honor and celebrate these lands and we acknowledge the traditional lands where you may be joining us from this evening. Tonight, we want to dedicate this celebration to our wild and free spaces, the wildlife that depend on them and to the people who care and defend them. People like each one of you here this evening and the people who work for and support AWA. Together with your help, the staff and volunteer board of directors keep AWA moving forward with integrity, tenacity, and dedication. Carolyn Campbell, Grace Wark, Sean Nichols, Nissa Peterson, Ian Urquhart, board president Jim Campbell and directors Chris Saunders, Richard Secord, Jamie Jack, Gail Dawkin, Frank Calder, Clint Dawkin, Nathan Schmidt, Deandra Brewstead, Cliff Wallace, and Vivian Ferris are here virtually and in person for this celebratory evening. Indeed, we are here to celebrate. Please reflect for a moment with me on this lovely image from Hazama, taken by Cliff Wallace, black spruce and beautiful cotton grass, and if you have one, raise your mug, coffee, tea, sparkling water. We have a little bit of sparkling water and wine going on here. And give thanks for the wild upper skies we are so blessed to know, the wild places we defend, the wild and free wildlife. Thank you, Cliff, for giving me the hand expressions that go with that toast that I like so very much. And the friends and colleagues and amazing people who join us here this evening as we share in this quest for wild spaces forever. Have a wonderful evening with all of us. Thank you very much. All right. I think we're gonna pass over next to Vivian Ferris to say a few words. Sean, if you wouldn't mind unmuting the microphone on that end. Oh, perfect. Go ahead, Vivian. Well, hello everybody, once again. Uh, I, it seems to me that I'm dreaming because I think that this is the third time I've been here in this position as uh, chair of the committee for uh, setting up the Wilderness and Wildlife Defender Defender Awards each year. And um, so uh, why are we doing this, you might ask? In fact, um, this is the um, 22nd anniversary of the establishment of these awards and for our distinguished um, lecture series. And um, I think we're using it as kind of a catch up year because if you could see the wall of fame behind me, uh, it, it contains a lot of plaques um, that commemorate people that uh, are deserving of this award who stood up for wilderness and wildlife uh, over a long period of time in this province. But we have a lot of catching up to, to do. So in this particular year, we decided that we would award not one, but three uh, exceptional people 
And uh, so far this year, we have awarded um, the ever more, uh, more memorable activist and writer, Kevin Van Tegen. We awarded him back in September, 2002. And we awarded Linda Duncan, uh, who is a long serving um, member of the um, parliament of the federal parliament for Edmonton with the NDP. And uh, she has recently retired and is coming back to Alberta to resume activism here. So, um, and tonight we will honor and hear from the uh, Dene Ta chief, James Ahenet Say, uh, who works in the Northeast corner of the province on a variety of conservation initiatives. And um, we'll uh, recognize him for the protection of the internationally significant Hayzama wetlands complex. And we'll also hear from his colleague, Matt Munson. Uh, I just want to end by saying it's hard to believe that 22 years have passed since AWA's brand new executive director back in the year 2000 met with um, then president uh, of AWA, Dr. Peter Sherrington and myself, and we sat down in the year 2000 to work out the details of a set of annual uh, awards in recognition of Albertans who have devoted uh, much of their lives to the betterment of wilderness and wild, its wild inhabitants. In the past 22 years, we have honored uh, 47 people and heard distinguished and challenging lectures from 22 people. And tonight we are long overdue in hearing one of Canada's original peoples who will talk about some of their critically important work uh, that is being carried out in the Northeast uh, hinterlands of Alberta. Thanks very much. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you, Vivian. And I believe now <laughs> we'll invite Ian Urquhart to say a few words. Welcome, Ian. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Urquhart. I'm the Conservation Director here at uh, Alberta Wilderness Association. Uh, in 2001, AWA introduced the Wilderness Defenders Award at our annual lecture series. When Martha Kostetz was taken from us and the land she loved and defended so ably in 2008, AWA renamed our annual lecture to honor Martha. What we are so pleased to offer you tonight, a conversation with Chief James Anise of the Dene Ta First Nation is one of AWA's longest lived examples of the conservation education, outreach, and recognition we are so proud to deliver. But there's something especially novel about tonight, and Vivian alluded to it a few minutes ago, that makes this always special event even that much more special. Tonight's award to Chief Anise is the first time AWA has bestowed a Wilderness Defenders Award on a member of a First Nation. As I reflected on Chief Anise's life, conservation accomplishments and conservation dreams earlier today, I really can't imagine a more deserving member of Alberta's peoples, First Nation or settler, to be on the wall of the Alberta Wilderness Defenders behind me. James's life, James's service to the Dene Tong and to Alberta's lands and waters, they've always have stressed preserving wild boreal spaces and First Nations traditions. Why? Because in his worldview, they are crucial ingredients to realizing healthy livelihoods for the Dene Ta. So too are education and science. The tapestry of good livelihoods that Chief Anise is weaving incorporates all of these threads. I hope that in his conversation with Cliff Wallace tonight, James will tell us something about his conservation accomplishments. These include creating the Hayzama Wildland Provincial Park in 1999. That park protects much of the internationally important wetland contained in the Hayzama Lakes Complex. Those accomplishments also include his work to twin Hayzama with another internationally recognized wetland half a world away, the Dalai Lake National Nature Reserve in Inner Mongolia. I know we'll also hear about his conservation dreams tonight when Matt Munson introduces us 
to the Bitchell Lake Indigenous Protected Conservation Area objective. I want to end my remarks with a couple of words about reconciliation. In the reconciliation section of the report of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you'll find words there about reconciling the relationship between First Nations and governments. I'd like to suggest that reconciliation has an important place as well in the relationships between First Nations and conservation organizations. Reconciliation between First Nations and the other peoples of Alberta demands we follow a variety of paths. I like to think that tonight's recognition of Chief Anase is one of those. So please join me in welcoming Chief James Anase to AWA's Wall of Wilderness Defenders. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> and now is the moment for that, uh, whoops, sorry, wrong direction here, for that moment of virtual applause. If you do want to turn on your camera, it'd be great to see you. All right. Uh, well, congratulations, Chief Anase. And now I am going to pass things off to Cliff Wallace to say a few words about the Martha Caustic annual lecture before we jump into our conversation. Go ahead, Cliff. Unmute. <laughs> yeah, I did it. Good evening. Uh, every year the AWA hosts the Martha Caustic Annual Wilderness and Wildlife Lectures given by renowned guest speakers. These lectures are meant to inform, challenge, and inspire AWA and its members, as well as further our mission of defending wild Alberta through awareness and action. The lecture honors Martha Caustic perhaps Alberta's most dogged environmental advocate and a friend who we still miss dearly. She was a national leader that left Canadians with an enormous legacy. She was recognized with Alberta Emerald Foundation, National Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Canadian Environmental Network, Nature Canada's Douglas Pimlot Award, and of course, AWA's Wilderness Defender Award. Martha was a people hugger, and a tree hugger and always a true friend of the environment. She helped create the Clean Air Strategic Alliance, one of the most effective consensus-based organizations on environmental issues in North America. And she was active in many NGOs, including the AWA, the Prairie Acid Rain Coalition, Canadian and Alberta Environmental Networks, National Air Issues Coordinating Committee, Friends of the West Country, and the Parkland Air Shed Management Zone. Although she was expert at bringing enemies, or so-called enemies, together, Martha could take on the biggest adversaries in court and win. She was instrumental in changing processes, laws, and attitudes. My proudest moment was when Martha and I took our fight over the Old Man Dam all the way to the Supreme Court. With the help of a great legal team, the Pecani Nation, AWA, Friends of the Old Man, won a landmark ruling that changed environmental law in Canada and asserted Canada's shared jurisdiction over the environment. Endless pressure applied endlessly. We can indeed wear down some tough rocks. We're in it for the long haul. Defending nature played a huge part in bringing meaning to Martha's life. Before she passed, she wrote a new vision for Alberta. It included a stable, resilient, healthy economy based on energies of the future, not of the past. She added, we needed to truly protect our wilderness, native prairies, wetlands and rivers, not just for their beauty and recreational opportunities, but for biodiversity and the fundamental human needs they help meet. Martha asked us to continue to defend the environment in her memory. AWA does that every day in our work on wild spaces and the creatures that inhabit them. Many other wilderness defenders are also honored on our recognition wall at the office. They and many others who we haven't yet gotten around to honoring are the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Tonight, we celebrate the many other wilderness defenders like Chief Anase who have helped us enormously in that struggle to advance environmental protection as well as the environmental rights of all Canadians. Thank you all for zooming in. Join me now 
for a conversation with Chief Anase. Are we? Here we go. I'm just inviting you now, Chief Anase, to unmute. Good evening, James. Chief evening. Anase, it is good to see you. We're glad you could make it. Yes, indeed. How are you doing and how is the community doing? I understand you were working on a COVID outbreak today. Uh, personally, I'm doing okay. Uh, this is my fourth day since I received a vaccine. Um, so as far as the side effects on the third day, I probably had the side effects for about maybe five or six hours. And that was it. <laughs> so you're feeling uh, good again. Oh yeah. But uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, we do have a, a COVID uh, outbreak and uh, there's a lot of people that, uh, affected. So hopefully we'll get through it. Yep. So we wish you well and we're glad that the vaccines are coming and more were coming on planes today. So yes. we expect that uh, we'll be out of this mess sometime later this year and hopefully back to a new kind of normal. But let's go way back in your life back to a place that I understand doesn't exist anymore, Tehabe. <laughs> and tell me a little bit about your birthplace and what that Hazama complex was like when you were young. Well, I'd like to uh, really start off by saying that um, in any uh, leader's work, uh, there's a whole pile of people uh, that makes things happen. And uh, certainly, um, a lot of our elders uh, of the past and uh, current ones that are still with us, uh, they play a, a large role. And I'm really appreciative of their role because they're the ones that were way ahead of us and were able to uh, pass on the information to us uh, to be able to work with you know, what we need to do. And of course, uh, all the council members that uh, served with me uh, through the years, uh, they certainly play a large role um, in the process that we were in. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the government governance team uh, also rely on staff. Uh, that's a very important role. Um, and we all, of course, the nation citizens, our members who, who play a large role uh, in what we do. And of course, there's the federal and the provincial government and the NGOs, and of course, the um, energy companies that were willing to um, uh, work with us to work towards protecting the uh, Heizama complex over the years. So I wanted to capture all these um, uh, different, you know, um, people that were involved, um, companies, entities, because uh, anything that needs to happen that results in a, a favorable outcome, it takes a lot of people, a lot of work to get there. So I'd like to thank uh, everybody that was uh, involved throughout the years uh, for that opportunity to uh, be here today. Uh, <clears throat> to the question that you ask, um, I was born in 1957 in uh, a place called Habe, uh, which no longer exists, just in people's minds, because uh, Habe was uh, used to be a community, a village in northern part of the uh, Heizama Hay Lakes. And uh, in uh, 1962, uh, there was a major flood that uh, caused a relocation of peoples to the southern end of uh, Helix uh, uh, 209. Um, and present day were uh, Chate, yes. And um, as a kid, I remember um, growing up in the first, I guess, five years of my life, uh, basically in Hebei. And uh, a lot of good little things, you know, I remember, you know. Uh, uh, playing in the spring water, you know, the thaw, uh, trying to canoe or uh, 
using the bathtub to <laughs> float on the highway, on the road, waterways and all that kind of stuff, uh, and uh, spilling into the water, all those things. Uh, those are great times, even using the canoe too. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, one of my favorite memories that um, my uh, a cousin of mine um, uh, on my mom's side, uh, he um, canoed us, my mom and I, uh, to go from where we live uh, to the Hudson's Bay, uh, which was in Hebei. And we lived about maybe, uh, I would say, three, three kilometers away uh, from that point uh, towards the west of there. And uh, I always remember that. Uh, very well, even though I was uh, probably about four years old. <laughs> uh, so because the, the following year was when the, uh, the big flood happened. So uh, lots of uh, fond memories, um, especially when the, uh, the parents uh, brought in uh, eggs, you know, from the spring harvest and uh, uh, ducks uh, throughout the summer. And of course, the fall time, there's a um, I can remember as a kid when the uh, snow geese or the geese uh, migration come through, it was uh, very uh, noisy. And uh, I, I missed hearing that, um, uh, definitely. So um, that's what I remember of uh, Habe uh, as a very, very young child. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you're very rooted in that country, but you've seen a lot of changes since then. What do you think have been the biggest impacts, the biggest changes that you've seen? Obviously, oil and gas came in, and I don't know if you had much say about it in those days, and did you realize what changes might come? Uh, well, in the early years, uh, throughout you know, my schooling, um, I didn't really have, uh, of course, too much uh, say in uh, the way things went, um, but I did um, you know, get to hear some uh, elders, including my grandparents, uh, speak of you know the worries that they have with the uh, encroachment of uh, energy companies, um, uh, more uh, like cut lines, uh, that, that kind of stuff coming in. And of course, uh, over the years, when I look at the uh, changes that happen, uh, the uh, harvesting of eggs, that kind of stuff, uh, of course, uh, that went down uh, quite a bit over the years. Um, I remember. Uh, in those days, uh, you know, some uh, grandmas and, you know, uh, the moms that kind of stayed around, you know, like while the, uh, uh, the men went out uh, trapping and so on. Uh, one of the ways that they um, uh, caught um, food is through uh, sudden traps, you know, where the, uh, uh, the ducks feed and that kind of stuff. And uh, surprisingly, you know, they do catch uh, uh, ducks in that manner too. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, uh, one of the things is the uh, when the molt season comes in, um, a lot of the uh, fellows go out on the boat. Uh, I could hear the you know like uh, drumming on the side of the canoe to uh, move the uh, I guess uh, the ducks along and, uh, and uh, to to a kind of a wading uh, bunch up front. And you know uh, when that happens, uh, they were able to uh, bring in a bunch of uh, ducks uh, to uh, feast on. So uh, from back then to now, uh, a lot of that, um, uh, the, the on the land stuff that we enjoyed, uh, many changes have happened. Uh, definitely uh, when the uh, oil companies move on to the waters of a Heizama, uh, a lot of things changed since then. Yeah, and you mentioned a long time ago that we got together a whole bunch of different people and made things change. And it was, I think, a pretty difficult process at times, even though people were kind of pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes government wasn't on side and then we got a different oil company that wasn't on side. Then we got one that was and people tried to upset the ap apple cart. But tell me a little bit about how you and the elders, I mean, you really stood your ground said what needed to be done and, and you made it happen. I mean, it was the first time we ever got limits on oil and gas exploration and development in Alberta. So that must have been pretty uh, satisfying to you and a, a proud moment for you to have seen that come come about. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, um, I guess one one of the very first um, memory of uh, the oil companies moving in uh, was um, when I was still uh, fairly young. Uh, I was still in a residential school uh, when I heard of a um, a serious uh, accident, accident uh, resulting in the death of one of our members, uh, a young fellow that was uh, at that time uh, out of school and working with the uh, pipeline company. Um, his um, he was a, a basa, and uh, he uh, lost his life because he got caught on you know those. Um, rotating uh, digger kind of for pipelines. So I, I, was, uh, I always may remember that um, um, whenever you know, people talk about you know, the first time uh, the oil companies move on to the lakes. So that's one of the things that you know, outstands. And the other ones are over the years, like, um, like I remember um, Elder uh, John Baptiste Talley, um, he's out on the land um, as usual, you know, like, um, and of course he says um, on his way back from one of the, the lakes on the more south uh, western side of the lakes, uh, he was uh, thirsty and uh, tired, so he saw clear water kind of spring coming out of the ground and into the lake, and it was uh, very clear and cold, cold water. So he figured that it would be okay uh, to uh, take a dip and he um, took a cup of it and drank it. And then um, within a short while, he said suddenly he lost uh, consciousness and he uh, fell down. He said he was very lucky he didn't drown because he uh, happened to land kind of his face in the water, but he was still able to breathe a bit. And he until he came to. And once he came to, he says, um, how near a death uh, he, he got to, right? So he told me a story about that a number of times over the years. And I always wondered in my mind, what would have caused that? Um, would there have been some kind of a, a bit of a gas, you know, uh, in it or whatever the case may be, right? Um, but those are kind of a profound moments where um, the effects of the activity on the lake really comes out to you know, face you. And that's one of the stories that I always remember is uh, Jean-Baptiste Tali uh, telling me about that. Right. So we have the wildland park now at Hezama. Um, I know that uh, all the cooperative management opportunities and training haven't all quite worked out yet. And I'm still hopeful it uh, will happen. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, have your treaty rights been upheld within the park? Do you think uh, things have gone relatively well that we're better off having oil and gas out of there? And while we might still have more work to do that it was a, it was a good thing to do together. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, I mean, uh, at, at the time that we were getting close to um, uh, to um, the Hazam Lakes becoming a wildland park, uh, one one of the things that really uh, dug our we dug our heels in was that uh, to the government of Alberta, we said uh, we will support uh, to protect the lakes, uh, the idea of having a wildland park. But the one thing we will not let go of is for us to continue exercising our treaty rights. And, and there was uh, quite, quite a, I guess, um, a reaction reaction to that, you know, including, uh, especially after the, um, the the wildland park was actually designated, designation happened because there's at least a couple of times where we were challenged. Uh, they were on the verge of charging people, uh, that kind of stuff. And we said, you know, hey, look at, uh, we agreed, uh, and you agreed that before we sign this, you are going to uphold our rights to exercise our treaty rights because uh, the Deneva and the Hezama Lakes and the whole 
traditional territory that we uh, uh, depended on. Uh, we were there um, for time immemorial, like they say, and we continue to be there. And uh, going into the future, if that uh, issue arises again, we will still maintain that we have the right to do so. And you do have the right to do so. You and we will support you on that. <laughs> so at least I think things are getting better at the federal level in terms of the recognition, maybe not always in actions, but at least on paper. Um, another big thing was the twinning with uh, Dalai Lake and Inner Mongolia. And we had a great trip with Christiane over to Inner Mongolia. And I think you felt a kinship with people over there. And there's a lot of similar issues that people face. Uh, minority communities, internationally significant wetlands, governments trying to interfere with doing things. Um, but what are your best memories of that trip and uh, that whole twinning process? Uh, well, the uh, meeting of the, um, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, delegation, and uh, in particular, the um, Inner Mongolian um, indigenous peoples. Um, that was a really um, the highlight of you know, meeting new peoples from a different country and actually uh, experiencing that um, even though um, their, I guess, um, their activities on the land was uh, much longer in terms of you know, industrial development, that kind of stuff, and then in Canada, uh, what I saw when I went to China is that landscapes uh, change. And you can just see where the regrowth of uh, reforestation and um, that kind of stuff uh, are happening today. Um, and that's what we're experiencing today is that, you know, uh, encroachment of um, industrial activity, forestry, farming, uh, oil and gas. Now oil and gas is kind of depleted, depleting and uh, the cleanup is happening, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, scars are left there. And, uh, and the highlight of the uh, trip to China uh, was when we were invited to um, have a feast out on the grasslands. Uh, that was uh, quite an experience there. <laughs> and uh, I really enjoyed that, you know, because uh, just people still really, you know, like even though they've gone through so much change, uh, they're still very much, you know, like um, holding on to their way of life. And that's exactly uh, uh, how I see um, uh, the Dinava people today is that uh, their hope is that one day um, the scars that were left on the lands would be uh, basically restored uh, as much as possible uh, in, in the future so that you know we can, we can continue to enjoy uh, what our uh, ancestors used to enjoy. Uh, we need uh, a lot of um, uh, wilderness left intact, not only for us as Denethar people, <clears throat> but um, Canadians in general, you know, because um, there's nothing we can do about uh, the growth of uh, people of the world. Uh, after all, we're over 7 billion people and uh, Canada is uh, <clears throat> about 37 million people. And of course, our neighbor to the south, there are over 300 million people. That's a lot of people. Uh, and more and more people need to uh, understand that it's very important to save a lot of wilderness areas for that very purpose, to continue that um, cultural preservation for the indigenous peoples, but also for the Canadians in general to also enjoy having a place to go uh, that is um, restored or untouched Yep, and I, we're going to hear from you and Matt about Mbecho or Bistio Lake, as we call it. Uh, and I think a big opportunity there. A lot of hard work, just like on Hazama, I think. But um, I know we'll get to talk about uh, that area quite a bit. But uh, I just 
do you have any update on what's happening with the Alberta to Alaska Railway? Because it would affect not only that area, but other areas as well. Is that uh, a reality? Is it another thing we're going to have to be on the horizon really soon, or is it off in the distance? Well, the um, uh, A2A um, process, uh, they, uh, they did an update for us and um, um, uh, very worrying that, you know, they, uh, the choice of um, proposed route is uh, somewhere from across the way from uh, Fort McMurray, uh, right through like past a uh, Fort Vermillion area. I would imagine they probably use um, the, the kind of a bridge location area to cross and make another bridge for the rail. And then it goes north, uh, northeast side of um, Meander River. And uh, that is also a concern to us because uh, Meander River community or the village there uh, depends on uh, groundwater, uh, the aquifer. And if any spill happened to the east, uh, the, the water actually comes, is fed, the aquifers are fed from the uh, caribou, uh, caribou hills or caribou mountain. Uh, so that's a very concerning area too. And then of course, uh, it pushes north uh, just to the south of uh, the uh, Mbecho uh, Lake. Uh, we call it Mbecho because that's what we call it. But it was translated to Bistro as probably by a beaver speaking person. So there's a little dialect difference there. So uh, when it, if it goes through the southern part of it already, uh, after that announcement, there's also a bit of an announcement in this area that uh, people are wanting to open up um, more leases for cabin, cabins to be built in uh, that area. And right off the bat, you know, like that's, there's a connection there. There's a push for that. <clears throat> and of course, uh, for the um, <clears throat> other the Dene people, the folks around here, in their mind um, is economy. And of course, um, a rail coming through uh, will, of course, provide economy to the area, uh, but we still have to be very watchful, uh, very concerned about you know, what kind of impacts it will have, especially it's going through uh, the caribou uh, that is uh, kind of in dwindling in numbers now, and for another um, transportation that's going to be uh, impacting the place for many, many, many years, and also uh, the, the possibility of uh, even regrowth of Zama, Zama City, or maybe even the Bistro Lake area. Uh, that's going to be an impact there. So it's very concerning to us. And um, uh, we, we, ha we also, I was with the Treaty 8 where CNR uh, also had a proposal. And I like their proposal because their proposal is using mostly existing lines. And the only new build would be from um, Fort McMurray, uh, either cutting across to uh, Red Earth and then down and connecting to the existing railroad at Slave Lake. And then from that point, <clears throat> it would be all on existing pipeline, I mean, uh, rail to the Pacific. And they also um, 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 will convert the liquid, um, petroleum or uh, oil, I guess, uh, to uh, what do you call those uh, pellets there? Um, oil, I forget the name. oil sand, yeah, I, I know right. what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so it will become kind of solid. It will be solid um, products that they deliver. And then once it gets to its des destination and overseas, uh, they just have to kind of add some uh, solution to it and then it reverts back to, you know, uh, the two components. So it's a, to me, it's a very safe way of uh, transporting uh, dirty oil uh, from uh, tar sands. Yep, it's still dirty oil, but it's safer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. The lesser of two evils, I suppose. Yeah. So we're getting near the end of our talk, but uh, I know you still get out of it in nature in the traditional territory. So are you able to get out and go canoeing and hunting and and enjoy that part of it? Or is the political stuff kind of keep you 
most of the time doing other things. Well, I, I would say the latter. <laughs> um, um, I, I would love to, you know, yeah, be, be out there more, but uh, it's uh, very difficult, you know, like uh, when you're busy all the time. And uh, uh, but uh, like I, I've seen my number of times that I have been on the Chinchaga, like over the years since I was uh, 16 years old, I did seven trips from um, three from. Um, um, the uh, Métis colony uh, area, uh, Cake River area, uh, from the Chin there to the bridge, and four times from the bridge to Mian River. Uh, so over the years, you know, I've seen some really good, uh, good experiences wow. you know, uh, on the land. Yeah, and of course, I did uh, a lot of hunting with uh, my parents or my dad, in particular uh, towards Rainbow Lake. Uh, the old mobile area, all those areas. Uh, I have uh, fond memories of those places. And of course, on the Hazama Lakes, you know, like uh, geese hunting when I was uh, in my teen years, uh, fishing, all those things, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't get a chance to do uh, much in uh, uh, Bistro Lake, but I, I did uh, make some trips over there in the winter time and in the summertime. So those were wonderful times. And we hope that we'll be there a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now that people can do that. So the last time we had a long talk with Ian, you mentioned your message of hope, uh, which is kind of the marrying the traditional values and your traditions with the modern world. Tell us a little bit more about that and how that plays into the hopes and dreams of the Denita and the future of your land. Well, I think the um, indigenous protected uh, and conserved area um, project is uh, really, um, it gives, gives me hope that uh, something good is going to come out of it. And as we spoke about, you know, like um, in years ago about uh, cooperative uh, management, all that stuff, I still have that in my mind and that we need to really uh, do a um, serious campaign uh, for students that are still in school, you know, uh, the youth that are still in school, so that um, they can appreciate what kind of uh, background a person ought to have to be able to really work on the land in a way that uh, both our people and also uh, the people that work in the government uh, both federal and the provincial, <clears throat> and also the Canadians in general, that when they are involved, they know the traditional knowledge and the science, scientific knowledge of the lands. So I think those two are key to uh, making these uh, projects really successful and actually have a Deneva uh, members working on that uh, in that process. Uh, into the future. And one of the ways that um, I started developing a, um, a, a Zoom recording uh, to, you know, like identify all the potential positions that we have in the Nevada First Nation and what is beyond the Nevada First Nation in the sense of what we talk about, you know, like uh, working on the land, you know, whether it's a, a conservation officers or uh, fish and wildlife uh, or uh, archaeologists, uh, geology and all that stuff, right? Uh, so the potential is there. And I think it would take uh, a group of people that you know can uh, work together to make that possibility happen, to make that campaign uh, be successful with the youth. And I had an opportunity to uh, be involved in some seminars uh, the uh, University of Alberta has been having um, in, in just in the past a few months. And uh, uh, the last time I was on there, I spoke to them about the very same thing. And they jumped on it and said that we, we would like to actually, you know, uh, form a committee uh, for them to develop a curriculum that would be um, 
I, I suppose, um, be part of uh, any uh, chosen field that a student goes into, whether it's a conservation officer or fish and wildlife and so on and so forth, right? Uh, part of the, uh, um, the indigenous component would involve that curriculum to be part of it <clears throat> so that they receive not only the uh, Western scientific kind of uh, way of um, uh, developing the capacity, but also having that traditional knowledge uh, inclusive. Um, when they graduate, you know, uh, their credentials will show that um, they have this degree uh, with this background that includes traditional knowledge. That's and it, really... could, it could even go as far as, you know, like a master's degree. And of course, a PhD, and then they have a choice of um, choosing the project that they, they would uh, do research on that would really kind of bring bring those things out. Right. And that's, that's really... what I hope for yep. and what I dream to see. Good. Well, we'll support you. And it's really exciting to hear that others are willing to jump on board. And I think that's a perfect segue into our next uh, talk that you, you and Matt are going to deal with the Mbecho. Mbecho. Yeah. Yep. I don't have the accent, but. <laughs> and uh, so I'll let Grace take over and uh, get Matt and, and James lined up for this next video and PowerPoint. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Thanks, Welcome. Cliff. It's an absolute privilege Thanks. to be able to listen into this conversation. It's just wonderful. So we are going to change gears a little bit and uh, pass things off to Matt, who's going to give us a presentation and present a video as well. Uh, so Matt is a Dene Ta First Nation band member, former Dene Ta First Nation Lands Department Director, and currently a technician with over 12 years of experience in geographic and information management systems to inform into community government and industry processes for planning, consultation, and traditional use study projects. At some okay. of the many, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, before we get uh, moving, mm -hmm. here's what I always do when uh, people don't pronounce the Neva properly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You, uh, mm -hmm. Put that tip of your tongue on your teeth, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. go, uh, right? Mm -hmm. and of course, mm -hmm. Australia starts with an ah, uh, right? Mm -hmm. do, do, do the two at the same time. The. 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 Hopefully, That's I will it. be correct with it. And I hope everyone is practicing with me. Thank you, James. I really appreciate that because <laughs> <laughs> it is an embarrassment in, in <laughs> pronunciation for me, unfortunately. But Dene Tha. Hopefully, hopefully I will get it by the end of the presentation. <laughs> uh, but thank you. So, you know, to, to wrap up um, Matt's introduction here, uh, at some of the many varied and diverse intersections where Western science and indigenous knowledge coalesce and combine is where Matt likes to be. When he's not working, he can also be found at the local outdoor rink practicing for the day when beer league rec hockey resumes once again. That's awesome, Matt. <laughs> so if you'd like to say a few introductory words, I will just get the video up and running and we'll, we'll get ready to present it to everyone here. Welcome, Matt. Well, thank you for that. It, it's, uh, it's such an honor to be here. I, I'm really happy to see everyone on the Zoom chat, I, I have to say this is probably about the most social interaction I've had in months and months. And so I'm really excited to see you all and, and to be here with uh, very like-minded uh, individuals who, who also believe that uh, conservation and, and protecting natural spaces is, is something that uh, we as, as humans and as Albertans and Canadians uh, is, is something that's important to to do so thank you so much um, <clears throat> yeah my my uh my Denny name is eve claus didzina and uh i've uh been really privileged to find my way back to my community and and learn from my elders uh it's been a uh, really a really uh you know lifelong journey for me to to now be in a position where i'm able to kind of bring what i've learned from um, uh, you know, growing up in, in one of the, in Calgary and, and going to the University of Calgary and, and doing Western scientific uh, curriculum and bringing that to my community and, and learning uh, from my, from my elders, from the trappers, from, from elders and youth. And it, it's, it's just been such a, 
such a an amazing journey. So I, I'm really very happy to share some of the work that we've been doing in our community with you. Um, certainly, um, you know, this is a, a Indigenous uh, led conservation for long term, uh, long term objectives. And, and as as Cliff and, and Chief discussed earlier, uh, it's it's not always uh, it's not always an, an easy go, and there's definitely uh, 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 things to work through as you go through, and, and new relationships to build, and uh, existing relationships to improve. So, um, with with the leadership, um, our community members, uh, you know, really uh, instructing and directing this program from the beginning. Um, it's just been such a uh, a pleasure to see how it's evolved to this point. And, and I think um, besides me talking about it, uh, maybe it would be a good time to uh, show you for yourselves. And uh, we've, we've been working with Environment Canada, um, uh, Alberta government, and, and, and some of our, our ENGO partners, partners on putting, on putting this, this video, video together, together for you. Nicole, and I'll just get that started here. Sorry, Matt, if you heard a bit of echo for a second, it's because I'm sharing my sound. All right. Here we go. This lake and the surrounding area of the land, it meant a lot to our Dene people. On this lake, there was like thousands and thousands of, of people here on this lake, around this lake. At Bistro Lake, we've got a really unique opportunity to have some type of indigenous protected and conserved area here. The area is a really biologically important area for a lot of different species, including caribou that are threatened. We find out there is a very, very important site here, quite, quite large, that stretches over several terraces along this place. And uh, we find out there is a quite, quite deep site and possibly quite old. I think it's important because once you find the connection there, you'll be able to understand the stories more. And maybe you'll even see a dream or something about what it was like back then, or what it can be like. We can retrieve some of the stories from, from uh, underneath the ground, and whatever we find that's it's like sacred or, or a treasure from back then, you know, all these things can help us regain our strength and to teach us something new. Archaeology has an interesting way of, of linking the past and bringing it to the present to remind ourselves of its importance and that we shouldn't forget where we come from. The sites go back at the lake at least several thousand years and then we are hoping at this site here that we're going to start excavating today that we will get some, some more information how the people left here you know what, the, what they were hunting. Hopefully we'll find some stone tools or maybe some datable artifacts could give us a little bit more in detail what how, how old is the site. She again has all the notching, it's like a scraper. This is like use wear on it to these little tiny small chipping. So most likely this is it's a piece of a tool. Hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, there used to be people living all over the lake. And mm -hmm. Like there's uh, people living here and mm -hmm. some people living there and mm -hmm. there was houses all over. And I'm quite sure there might be burial grounds too. Almost every test that we are digging here, it's, it's positive. We are finding either bone or the, like the small, small chips or flakes. Long time ago, my dad used 
top over here. Happy just just to be at a site where my dad used to be. Even in this hand cut with the axe, it's just like a memory. We came across this cabin foundation that was Charlie's dad's cabin. And to see Charlie at his father's cabin on this island in the middle of Bisho Lake and was amazing. Caribou are really in a dire situation in Alberta. Uh, the 15 herds that we have that are managed by the province, all of them are in decline and none of them are considered to be self-sustaining. When we combine traditional knowledge with Western science, they are mutually reinforcing. We've got caribou wildlife camera traps out the location was specified by a Deneda member. We have the chance to stop this herd from continuing on this decline and actually give them the opportunity to grow in, the, in that population rather than just trying to keep them from the brink of extinction. My grandfather used to live here and even cook on that stove and even had beds, wood table, homemade tables and everything. I love being here. It's so it's so nice to be here. So it's so beautiful. A ranger station, indigenous guardians, elders and youth, academia, industry, government other nations all coming together to celebrate this amazing place and this amazing collaboration that we've come together to be able to have a meaningful direct way of protecting our land and what's important to not only us but all Albertans and all Canadians and everyone across the world. And, and as we move into the sub-regional planning process, we really want to partner with the community and really want to understand the interests of the community members. And I think for me, that's very much why I'm here this week up here at Bistu Lake, is to sit down with the elders and to sit down with community leadership and, and with their technicians and, and with Indigenous scientists and really understand, you know, where we can find balance. And we want to bring everyone together in a place uh, that's still intact, still pristine like Bisho Lake. And we want to be able to work together and do this together through a guardian program or having our people on the land, having our community members revitalize this place. It's a symbiotic relationship. So there's been an opportunity where, you know, all three governments have been able to come together and really try to make something happen here to protect this area. All Albertans and Canadians can, can benefit from um, a healthy landscape in this corner of the province. There's a real opportunity here as one of the last sort of pristine unprotected frontiers for us to do something meaningful so that generations to come can see what, you know, a, a pristine boreal forest really looks like that's, you know, been protected and had been stewarded uh, in the right way to maintain cultural values, to maintain values of, of land stewardship and, and you know clean water and, and nature and you know viable animal populations. You know, hope for the greater days where people can live among here and laugh with each other, play with each other, go hunting with each other, go fishing with each other and have a good life here together. We need that part to regain our strength back to this, to this lake and to regain our culture. It's coming from my heart, I said, it's not only me. It's from the ancestors that used to live here. 
they were here today, they would say the same thing. Once we heal ourselves, the land will heal and the water will heal. But I want to see things regain, restore and uh, retrieve our, our land the way that our land treated us back then. Thank you for sharing that. That's a really beautiful video. I'm just going to boot up your presentation now here. And if you want to take over, Matt and Chief Anise, feel free to take it away. Great. Thank you very much. Um, it's always really nice to have a new audience. Um, I think some of the audience has seen it before. I know Cliff and I think Carolyn have, have uh, for sure. But um, it's, it's just such a as, as you saw in the video, it's just such an amazing place and really words don't describe it. PowerPoints don't describe it. It's just something um, I really hope that all each one of you are, are fortunate enough to, to visit on, on your own one day. Um, so to our presentation, um, Chief James and I have not pre, <laughs> have not uh, really done too much of a, of a, of a of a practice run on this. So what we did uh, at one of our presentations for the U of A, uh, we just kind of rolled through the slides. And, and if, uh, if, if James, uh, you have something that you wanted to um, contribute on this, uh, especially the place names, I think that would be, that would be super uh, uh, by all means. Thank you. Um, this PowerPoint uh, was developed in collaboration with uh, CPAWS Northern Alberta um, Keisha Kerr, and she was in the video. I'm sure some of you may know her as well. Thank you. What is an IPCA? Um, IPCAs are uh, lands and waters where Indigenous governments have primary roles in protecting and conserving ecosystems through Indigenous laws, governance, and knowledge systems. This is directly from the Indigenous circle of experts, and I'm not going to read uh, from the slides again, but I do want to note that this is the um, accepted definition of the Indigenous Circle of Expert panel, and that was through the, the, the National Advisory Panel, um, which was a, 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 a national level uh, collaboration where uh, Indigenous communities, governments, um, and others came together to uh, really set out, you know, what, what uh, um, you know, reconciliation tools may, may uh, I don't want to say be missing, but may contribute to the space in Canada. And, and this is the, the group and the, uh, the, the, the uh, guidance that they had provided through the Indigenous Circle of Experts. Next slide, please. Um, so we, three really main elements um, define an, an IPCA. There's really no uh, formula for these. There's not, uh, you know, some recipe or, or some existing uh, legislation or, or regulatory, um, you know, uh, thing that says, here's what an IPCA is, and here's how you go about doing it in, in each of the provinces and the territories. It, it's nothing like that. Um, but you will see um, three essential elements, and these are Indigenous-led um, long-term commitments for conservation, which typically would mean some type of uh, designation, um, land designation, and uh, elevating Indigenous rights and responsibility. And so um, the responsibility part it really is about a reciprocal, um, you know, responsibilities to, to the treaty rights. The, the treaty rights, you know, um, rely upon uh, clean and healthy water, land, uh, ecosystems, air, um, all of these things. And so um, in order to be a, a, a good steward and, and also to uh, live in the ways that, uh, that the elders had come before us, you know, it, it really is a, a responsibility and a reciprocal uh, duty. 
that you'll find um, just embedded in, in the culture, but, but especially in the language. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, um, indigenous led, really this is a, a, a Dene the uh, project a, a initiative. Um, it did come about it, through the community um, stories for, for generations about uh, Bisjo being a, a really important uh, place that, you know, the, the community, uh, uh, the peoples, uh, this is one of our, this is one of our, our origins. And so even though the, the National Advisory Panel and the ICE report kind of defined what an IPCA um, should be or could be, um, you know, it, this has always been uh, unquote IPCA of Dene that it, it's always been this way. Next, please. Yeah, long-term commitment to conservation. And so typically um, there would be some uh, more formal governance type documents that would set forward a, a management plan. Typically these would be uh, collaborations between uh, governments, including provincial governments. And so there's uh, quite a spectrum of, you know, of decision-making and, and uh, uh, collaboration that can occur. Uh, one is basically having um, direct um, jurisdiction to, you know, kind of set laws and rules. And that's certainly uh, not without its uh, share of liabilities, for example. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you may have uh, where, you know, there's actually really not much input at all. It's just, you know, government uh, provincially or uh, would, would be uh, running things and might, you know, notify you from time to time. And I think the spectrum that, that the community seems to be looking at is to more, uh, more towards a cooperative management approach. And so that's a little bit different than a co-management approach. It's not uh, equal decision-making, uh, but, but definitely uh, is informed planning, implementation, direct participation, um, being able to have a say in, in decisions that are made in the area uh, that would directly and, and indirectly affect um, the community members, but also the uh, the lands and resources that the community members rely upon for the exercise of their continuing treaty rights. Next, please. Yeah, and I, I think I spoke to this one already. Oh, maybe we'll go back, just people wanna read it, thanks. Um, I just wanted to note that the video itself, um, it might not be apparent, uh, but we were following all of the, the protocols for COVID. There was uh, specific guidance for um, hunting and outfitting guide camps, and those were all adhered to, as well as the federal rules uh, that were in place, um, that are in place. And so there was, uh, there, all of that work was done um, under, the, under the rules. So. I just wanted to note that it looks in the video, people get pretty cozy there. And, and I just wanted to, to note that. Yeah, um, next slide, please. Yeah, in a Canadian context, <clears throat> you know, these are all really important aspects of IPCA. Um, in examples um, across Canada, there are different um, Indigenous led, uh, Indigenous directed, um, ideas for these, but essentially they, they pretty much boil down to, you know, being, being uh, official agents of your own, uh, you know, uh, custodians of, of your territories and, and being directly uh, involved in, in things like compliance, um, monitoring, research, um, <clears throat> some possibly some enforcement roles, and uh, most certainly uh, planning consultation and uh, um, management and decision-making. Next, please. <clears throat> this is our, uh, one of our very esteemed uh, elders, uh, late Willie Chambeau. Um, this is a, a traditional use study map uh, that we have. I actually have the same one behind me. Uh, this is one of the maps that we made uh, for digitizing um, community information at, at personal and focus group style interviews. 
as you can see on the slide here, you can you can note the level of detail that uh, that uh, late Elder Willie is is putting into. Um, typically, I just wanted to note this. Typically, when uh, people are drawing trails, they'll kind of do a line, like they'll just put the pen down and draw a line. Uh, Willie is actually putting dots at like he's he's in his mind uh, recalling exactly. Uh, where they where he remembers along the along the trail on the map, and so these are um, this this level of detail is really important as we move into uh, planning and and uh, uh, activities and implementation of an IPCA. For example, these would be uh, heritage trails that would be um, restored and maintained, and ideally um, <clears throat> winter access. Um, you know, I, I, the the community members have said, uh, you know that. It, if they don't want a, an all season road in there where it's gonna, you know, open the floodgates to, to, um, you know, the pressures that are not there now. And so the idea is that uh, heritage trails could be uh, put in place where they were traditionally used and maintained for um, perhaps winter access or, or snowmobiling in, um, but low, kind of low, low impact, uh, sustainable, more sustainable recreational activities. Next, please. <clears throat> Here's a map, um, doesn't really show up too well here for some reason. Um, there's no actual defined geographic boundary that we put on the IPCA proposal simply because um, once you put a boundary down, people like to, um, you know, they sometimes misinterpret it to be, uh, areas of exclusion, and that's certainly not the idea, as, as you recall from the video. Um, on here, though, are some boundaries that were not ours, uh, but are geopolitical and, and some uh, uh, la uh, water, um, uh, 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 <clears throat> so we have the, the Bistro sub-regional planning boundary, we have the Bistro caribou range, we have, there's a protective notation that was put in by the province to uh, for the sole purpose of protecting uh, the caribou herds up there, and uh, also the uh, the watershed and uh, uh, our tr our reserve lands that we have on the shores of the lake. Next, please. Um, James, uh, I'm going to maybe call on you here. This is about uh, language and some of the place names that we have. Um, James was James and the late Baptiste Machuia were. Uh, actually working with elders some some years ago and uh, and developed uh, place names uh, mapping in in three different dialects and so the output of that is actually uh, what you see on the right hand side and this is part of the uh, Royal Alberta Museum display on place names and you can actually go to the Royal Alberta Museum when it opens again and uh, you'll be able to see some of the work uh, of, of Chief Anise and uh, our late Baptiste. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Matt. Yeah, um, back in, I think it was uh, 2014 thereabouts, um, we did uh, some work on the um, place names. <clears throat> the one um, I think I told um, Cliff a while ago is that Mehcho um, is actually translated, it means um, uh, uh, the big sleep or big sleep because uh, uh, in Dene <clears throat> when I'm when I say uh, I feel sleepy I would say uh, surdi or surdi. that means like the knife uh, wants me or needs me so that's uh, they, they use that uh, kind of a, I guess uh, language to uh, say whether you're sleepy, if you're uh, if you have fallen asleep, uh, then you would say the knife killed me or killed him or her, whatever, right? So that's where that term comes from because uh, in history there was a um, um, a story about um, a, a giant uh, that uh, slept there, uh, and so they they named it uh, the place Mecho. Uh, uh, because of the uh, giant supposedly uh, sleeping there. And I think what I gather from it present day is that um, I would imagine back in the days of uh, glaci glaciation uh, receding, 
um, the lake would be one of the last place to continue having a large chunk of ice. And uh, it may have looked like a giant sleeping uh, in that area. <clears throat> and I was talking with um, the former chief um, from uh, Chippewan Prairie, uh, Walter Janvier. And when I told him about, you know, uh, the place name, he remembers his elders telling him about a place called Bechcho. And that goes to show, you know, like um, uh, they live, uh, you know, where the Chippewan Prairie, uh, Janvier, that area, that's where um, his community is from. And that means that uh, people communicate with each other uh, in uh, far places who are the Dene people. <clears throat> so in a way, that's the background of the name. And uh, the, the hill, uh, we call it uh, Nagahi. Nagahi. Uh, in the north, further north, they say Nagahi. Uh, and na, Naga means like, um, it's like saying uh, warriors, uh, warrior hills. Because um, to the east, um, at the time, I guess there would be um, sometimes uh, a neighboring tribe coming from the east. And that's the kind of like um, uh, a protected area between Dene from that area and on that side. So uh, that's what uh, it refers to. Um, and then of course, Tahche uh, is the um, community of a Mian River. And uh, Ta is a river. Che means like a, a, the brother of the big, uh, smaller um, river joining with a larger body of water. Uh, it's like saying a little brother joining in the big brother. Uh, so, and so on and so forth. So that's how uh, these uh, place names are named. Um, the uh, traditional names, uh, when you look at it, when you can actually uh, translate it. Like the Heizama, uh, we call it Khaetlo. And that means um, open grassland, um, lakes, rivers, you know, it, it can be referred to a river uh, going through there. Like then we say Hatlo De, Hatlo De or Hatlo Zahe. That means uh, the Hei River flowing through the uh, Heizama. And of course, you probably heard in Hei River where the um, the Hay River flow, outflows into uh, the Great Slave Lake. Uh, the people there call themselves Katlo Deheche, and that means uh, people of the Hay River uh, are the are the outflow, you know, the Delta area, because it flows into the large uh, body of water. So, so, but they have a slightly uh, different um, dialect. So we say Katlo, they say Katlo. Right, and that's where it comes from. So that's just kind of a, a bit of explanation about how uh, these uh, play, place names uh, all came to be, and uh, uh, we were able to um, um, have a good session with the, the elders um, from Chate, Meander, and Bushi uh, to be able to um, fine tune uh, all these uh, different areas that uh, people. Uh, habit and uh, habitat before uh, in the years past. And, uh, and our next step really is to work with the place names um, society, I guess, of Alberta and uh, see if we can reintroduce uh, the Dene place names in our area. I think that's the right thing to do. And of course, like anything else, this is where we need uh, um, uh, other folks, you know, that have um, uh, a good connection with the government or uh, the people that um, work in those areas to help us to make sure that uh, it's uh, advocated for and that it, it happens. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, James. That's fascinating. Um, I could listen to, to you tell those stories all day. Um, Oh, I just wanted to note, uh, there, there is some work done on the language. It was, I believe it was Dr. Pat Moore out of University of British Columbia. And uh, so there, there has been uh, some documentation of, of, uh, of Deneda in, in, 
in the ar in the archives. I'm not exactly sure where that is at currently, but maybe that's something uh, we can follow up on at some soon point here. Um, traditional use, archaeology, this is a really uh, important area, as, as you saw in the film. Um, what we've been able to accomplish is, is uh, Alberta culture has actually desig has, uh, designated um, uh, the entire, all of the quarter sections that overlap the shoreline around Bistjo Lake as areas that will re uh, would require um, actual uh, shovels in the ground testing, not just desktop reviews if ever there was to be some uh, proponent that was looking to um, do some type of disturbance here. So um, the work that you saw in the video is actually translating into some, into some real type of protections, um, in this case through the um, Historic Resource Inventory Act. Next, please. This is some of our traditional use study information. Um, we have a geo database of um, traditional use study information that's been provided. Over the course of many years, we, we have done many traditional use studies for various proponents and projects, including pipelines, uh, land use planning, um, you know, forestry stuff. And uh, over and over again, uh, Bistjo Lake um, shows up as one of, one of, the, one of the busiest intersections of, of culture and, and landscape in our, in our data and, and in, in our communities. Next, please. Um, there is a, a bit of a history of proposed protection here. So in the, in the 1930s, um, Indian Affairs uh, recognized that uh, given the population and, and where we are and, and what the community needed for food security that they had proposed an exclusive, this is an exclusive uh, hunting preserve that would have been for uh, Deneda band members. Um, but unfortunately that, uh, uh, that idea was not followed through, even though it 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 was uh, documented to the point of making maps and actually having uh, proposals go to decision makers in government at the time. I wonder how differently the the land might look today if if this had been done then. Next, please. Um, here's here's the cabin area that you saw in the video. We have two reserves on the lake, uh, Bistro Lake 213 and Jackfish Point 214. This is the location of where we propose to have our base camp for the uh, uh, IPCA. And also this is with the uh, research station. We're hoping to have cabin upgrades, including the ability to, um, to have power, uh, 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 water, uh, gas, to have uh, a base of operations for research and uh, um, uh, internet and, and everything else that, that uh, you would need to uh, really um, manage the uh, the research and, and Indigenous Guardian programs. Indigenous Guardian programs basically would be uh, community members, but but also other members of society that wish to be part of doing some of the active type management things for recovery of, for example, of caribou habitat, um, you know, and those type of uh, uh, restoration activities, seismic lines, what have you. Next, please. Caribou range. These are um, in the video you saw us collecting data from a camera. This is the this. These are some of the uh, these are some of the detections. Um, as you note at the bottom slide, we have found one of Alberta's collared animals, and uh, we are working with uh, uh, the lead uh, uh, provincial um, caribou experts right now. In fact, um, on. Uh, finding that animal in this location and in this instance uh, and tracing it back through their own data. And so looking to see, we're gonna be able to tell the story of this caribou because um, we're quite confident that we believe we can identify it in, in, the, uh, in the large, um, uh, the, the Alberta uh, data set. So we'll, we'll keep you informed. We'll, we'll definitely send notes to Cliff and Grace and, and, uh, and others at AWA and we'll give you an update. Next, please. Um, there's other, uh, many other values there. You can see from the, from the video just how diverse it is. Next, please. <clears throat> um, industry, oil and gas footprint, forestry, um, seismic, uh, some graveling. They're looking at uh, that uh, actually the A2A rail 
um, depends upon uh, opening up new mining projects along the route. And so we're a little bit concerned about uh, uh, the potential for um, new industry to appear if there was uh, that outside uh, impetus put in place via a new railway. And we understand that uh, uh, the remoteness is, is the primary uh, factor in, in uh, keeping this area pristine. And once you build a railway with a high grade road and with all of the service and, and everything else that uh, that type of project would require, um, you know, this is basically, uh, uh, this is the new frontier. And so, uh, yeah. Matt, mm -hmm. can you mention about the, uh, the crater? Yeah, yeah, there's a crater if you look um, just um, kind of on the east part of this map. Uh, there's a circle of oil wells, and uh, uh, I believe it was uh, 75 million years ago or so, uh, there, was a, there was a very large uh, impact site here. And uh, what happened was it, it actually uh, deformed the, the sedimentary layers and, and created uh, an oil trap along its perimeter. Um, and, you know, there's, there's other, other things that uh, probably happened from that uh, impact, but, but certainly it's, it does uh, influence uh, some of the local um, development that we see. Um, oh, notably, uh, uh, Chief would know about this one. There's a, a natural gas seep that comes out of the ground, kind of closer to Taché, uh, meander, and that's actually been uh, um, that. It, it's a natural gas seep, and it's in it's in a bit of a, a, a pit, and that has been uh, kept lit continuously for countless generations by our community. And uh, unfortunately, that's right in the direct path of this uh, proposed railway. So um, in the last few um, weeks, I've been uh, snowshoeing in the back woods where I live, uh, training up to uh, make a trip, uh, um, I guess a cut into that, um, to the bog gas. Um, that's a kind of a, maybe about uh, three hours in and then three hours back out. So. Uh, my brother-in-law, my sister, uh, and then uh, my other my brother, and two two nephews. Uh, they were in there about uh, maybe a month ago, and they said it's a really nice uh, kind of trip in by snowshoe. So I've been looking forward to that. Yeah, there's there's many many sites uh, really beautiful up here. It it just needs to be protected, absolutely. Here's uh, some of the goals of the IPCA. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware of Canada Target One. Co-management, of course, uh, caribou habitat. Um, there's an opportunity for interjurisdictional just because it's in the corner of the province. So it does border NWT and BC and some of the nations on the other, uh, in those jurisdictions, uh, um, I, I think there's some opportunity there that is largely unexplored to see if there's some interjurisdictional uh, conservation that could occur. Um, really, it's about you know long-term commitments, conservation, indigenous values, traditional food security. If you are ever invited into the home of one of our community members once COVID is gone and you sit down for dinner, it, it's it's you know 50% or more is is country foods. Um, we have uh, uh, harvesters that will go out and, and uh, harvest for those that are not able to harvest for themselves. So it could be uh, young families, it could be elders, um, uh, could be people that for some other reason are isolated or, or infirm and uh, uh, food is, is never sold and it, it, is, uh, it is absolutely uh, shared and it's vital, it's vital. Um, a lot of the health uh, uh, issues that, that crop up seem to be related to, um, you know, a, a, an unhealthy diet of, of kind of uh, Western foods. And so, um, you know, it, it definitely is uh, tied to not only culture, but also health and social well-being and, and livelihood. Our documentary was put together by uh, my good friend, Jeremy, uh, at River Voices. Um, and we had uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada um, and CPAWS as, as a couple of our other allies and partners. And there's, there's others. Next, please. 
we do have a, a website where those videos are. We have a short version and a long version. Um, there's also a, a little bit of information about some of the projects that we've been doing, and uh, uh, it, it, it's it's a, uh, updated all the time. And so, if you're interested in getting some updates, um, you can sign up on the website. And uh, the video that you did see is actually part of a, there's there's a four part um, IPCA uh, documentary that's coming out, and this is one of them. I'm not sure if it's going to be combined into uh, like a half hour or a, or a 45 minute piece, but it is going to be uh, published by EC uh, Environment Canada itself, and it's going to be part of the uh, communications uh, uh, tools that that uh, the federal government is going to be uh, sharing with all Canadians and internationally quite soon. So thank you very much. Thank One you, more Chief thing. And Matt, there's... All ahead. of the all of the photos and videos that you've seen in the in the presentations are all uh, authentic. There was not there's no stock footage in any of these. I just wanted to note that. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks yeah, again. <laughs> I'll do my yeah we'll do our <laughs> thank you that was that was a great presentation and I think Matt it made it all the more impressive when you told us that documentary was filmed during COVID because it adds a whole other layer of complications just a stunning documentary that you presented to us as well so now it's it's our pleasure to transition into uh, a short discussion and uh, question period. And I see a couple coming through here. Uh, the first question uh, comes from Linda Wiggins, and this goes to uh, Chief Anise. The question is, did you ever find out what was in the water that Jean-Baptiste drank? I think you, you may have mentioned, you know, it's, it's speculated that it could have been something from, from the oil and gas wells. And if, if you don't know, are there other instances of pollution that you've seen that's impacted the community? Uh, no, uh, we never found out um, what uh, caused him to uh, get knocked out, I suppose, <laughs> mm -hmm. at the time. So uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, we did report it uh, mm -hmm. to uh, the conservation uh, office. And um, they were supposed to go back there to, you know, check into the, uh, the, the, the water, the aquifer coming out, I suppose. Uh, but uh, we never received any uh, information on what uh, caused it. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of speaks to, to all the more how frightening it might be to have kind of looking at that map that Matt presented, all this this network of, of industrial development to know, okay, well, all of this is here. What impacts is it actually happening on, on mm -hmm. people who are out on the land? Um, the next question comes from, from Cheryl Bradley, um, and she asks, what are the treaty rights that you've had to fight to uphold within the Wildland Park? And is there a common understanding and acceptance of these rights now? It's basically hunting, fishing, trapping, mm. and harvest. Mm -hmm. So those are the four areas that um, is in the treaty, treaty number eight. And... Uh, uh, the beginning of the um, uh, wildland park, there was a reluctance from the Alberta government side to um, continue, you know, like um, traveling into the area and uh, using the land as before. Mm. Well, there was a bit of, you know, like a, a more from the uh, field field workers, you know, the uh, the enforcement officers. Uh, but uh, uh, within a year or two, uh, it was uh, straightened out. So now they don't bother the people. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now it's an important learning curve yeah. and one that must be challenging to go through for everyone involved. Um, I think I, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now, but I have one listening to you both speak. I'm, I'm interested in what ways are you engaging the youth in the community uh, to get connected with the landscape, to become part of um, you know this indigenous protected and conserved area, so that they can they can carry forward these efforts into the future. Well, no one one area of, uh, really um, involved in the youth is the um, archaeology uh, digs uh, they, that they have been uh, having uh, locally. Like this coming summer, and the intent is for um, Greg, um, the archaeologist, to uh, go into um, Amber River uh, Reserve area 
and they want to do kind of some uh, digging in that area. And uh, <clears throat> they're actually going to um, do a live feed. Mm. So the students at the school will be watching uh, as uh, they progress. Oh, wow. And uh, <clears throat> with the uh, Bristol Lake, like um, I know in the past years, uh, they organize some uh, trips into the area so that you know they can uh, teach them how to uh, uh, set up uh, uh, nets and uh, fishing and uh, those sorts of things. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there's uh, some involvement. Also, uh, when uh, families do go out on the land, they they do they do take their uh, children or youth with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. The that live streaming sounds really really interesting. It must be just a great way to engage to kind of see in real time, um, you know, pieces and artifacts being uncovered. Um, the next question comes from Linda. She asks, and this could be for, for either of you, have any oil or gas leases already been issued in the Vistier Lake area? I don't believe so. Not in the lake anyway. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so the next question, uh, <laughs> another one for me, it was, um, it really struck a chord to hear you, Chief NSA, to, to speak about seeing uh, snow geese and, and have and talking about the changes that you've seen over your lifetime. So I was wondering, Matt, could you speak to any changes that, that you've noticed in your lifetime in the area um, and that you've felt really personally? Yeah, I hear a lot of stories from elders about um, one thing is, is birds. And so um, there's a, a bit of a invasive species with magpies coming north. And uh, elders tell me time and time again how they used to wake up in the morning and you, it was impossible to sleep in because of all the songbirds and, and all the different songs. You, couldn't, you could not sleep uh, past, uh, past dawn. And so what they noticed is that um, around uh, the Paddle Prairie area, um, you know, this is about 100 kilometers to the south or so, uh, and it, it, it seems every decade that the, the magpies, you know, go another 100 kilometers further north. And uh, they've noticed a, a, a really uh, sharp decline in, in bird species and songbirds. Also, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like uh, uh, wetlands being uh, uh, taken over by uh, grasses and bulrushes. And, and they're seeing, um, you know, different, when, when, when we go out with our scientific uh, equipment, we're seeing differences in, in elevated, uh, uh, or sorry, lower pH values, so more acidic. And those are directly um, things that elders are, are noticing that are um, backed up by Western science. Mm -hmm. And then another one I noticed, I heard recently is that there typically was uh, two recruitments of, of uh, wood bison um, you know, that the elders couldn't remember. So in the spring and then a little bit later on. Uh, but, but in recent years, they're seeing a third recruitment happening just because of the season is, is, uh, is longer. And uh, what's happening is that the third recruitment, uh, they're not surviving and they're actually uh, fueling, well, not fueling, feeding the predators. And so the predators are sticking around longer and, and uh, they're, they're, they're also impacting other uh, species like moose and and others and caribou. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, these are these are really uh, these are really pronounced uh, and very specific, very specific uh, things that community members are noticing, and they're yeah. they're letting me know that through uh, my discussions with them. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a bit of a follow up to that. There's a question from our own AWA's own caribou person, Carolyn Campbell. Uh, she asked if you could talk a little bit more about about caribou and what you're learning from monitoring them. Yeah, thanks. So um, what we're learning is, uh, is that there's uh, more so about the predators, actually, is that the wolves in the caribou, uh, sorry, in the Bisho Lake area, there seems to be two main packs. And they, uh, one of the packs ranges really uh, far into Northwest Territories and then comes around the, uh, there's the, there's the Bisho Lake, uh, sorry, the, the Cameron Hills Escarpment, and they'll kind of range right out to the edge and then come back in. And then there's another um, uh, uh, predator uh, group that will, uh, that they kind of circle the other way towards the Western side of the lake. And so what, what you're seeing is, um, especially on those uh, in the lake, there's these two big islands and those are actually serving as a, a, a refuge. So 
in the video, you saw the caribou. Those caribou were actually, uh, that camera was on one of the big islands in the lake. And so what you're seeing is, is uh, we, didn't, we didn't have any detections of wolves. I think we only had what, uh, uh, one, one uh, instance where we actually uh, were able to detect uh, wolf tracks when we actually went to the camera. But it seems like those islands are uh, providing uh, refuge for, for caribou from predators. And so, you know, when we see, for example, the, the, the sub-regional planning process that the, uh, Scott talked about in the video, um, and that it doesn't seem like they're going to be uh, considering protecting any areas at all, um, you know, that, that's very troubling because especially those islands are critical in the, in the life cycle of, of uh, maternal uh, 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 life cycle for the caribou. And they're, somehow they're able to uh, go there be, and it, it, it's almost like uh, those, the, the, the predators are doing their rounds. Um, and it seems like um, uh, that those islands are, are really important places for them to go and um, to, to rear uh, calves and, and move on. Um, when the ice comes in, the, actually they have to leave the islands because the wolves can travel across the ice and it's no longer safe. So what that dynamic is, is uh, something really interesting. Um, the elders have said they've seen uh, uh, mother and calf, really young calf, uh, going across from the, from the mainland to the islands. And uh, I, there was one story where, where one of the calves didn't make it because uh, the, the water was too rough. So you can imagine if if uh, that's what those caribou if if that's what those animals uh, are doing that there is a really good reason uh, at, at for that if you know imminent mortal danger and so that that dynamic is something that needs to be well, more well understood and uh, certainly if there are areas like that that need to be protected that's something that uh, the province uh, must must do um, and they're not planning on doing that yet from what I understand and that's concerning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for speaking to that. I think uh, we have time for maybe one more question here. Um, I'll take one from Kat. It's, it's what other artifacts have been found around Bistjo Lake? Uh, what is the oldest? And you could, could you talk more about the ongoing archaeology projects there? Yeah, there, there was, uh, there was one uh, artifact that it, it seems to be a unique tool that was actually, uh, it's uh, Athapaskan Dene. So Athapaskan is the is the is one of the uh, language roots that uh, Western scholars have identified. And it seems to be a tool that was, uh, was uniquely Dene. And so they found it up as you go north, but they've also found it in the Bistjo area um, for Dene. And, and uh, there are uh, groups of Dene speaking Athapaskan uh, ancestors that live in uh, uh, New Mexico. Uh, and so it would be really interesting to see if that particular tool shows up down there. I know, mm -hmm. I know Chief has uh, more uh, insight on that. James, did you have any more comments? Otherwise, I think that brings us to a close for our question period. No, I think uh, Matt covered it pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so really, uh, sorry, go uh, ahead. <laughs> archaeological uh, digs that uh, we were involved in uh, over the years, uh, they're all very uniquely interesting mm -hmm. in locations, yeah. And yeah, uh, some of them, see. like uh, Matt indicated, like um, uh, there's a linkage between uh, different um, Athabascan or Dene tribes uh, throughout uh, North America. So really interesting. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So I would just like to say thank you both so much for speaking for your presentations. Yeah, um, Cliff, is, Cliff is giving you the digital round of applause. Um, mm -hmm. It's been just fantastic uh, to have you here and to listen. And, and it's a really exciting time, I think, uh, you know, not just here, but across the country to see greater recognition of guardian programs and of IPCAs and the, and the work that's been mm -hmm. done uh, since time immemorial. Uh, so I'm, I'm now going to thank you. I'm going to pass things off to Ian Urquhart at AWA headquarters uh, for a few thoughts. Ian, feel free to go ahead. All right, thanks very much, Grace. And, and thanks everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, what, what I'd like to do, just take a couple minutes to do this, is uh, think about 
I'll share you my views. And that is sort of like, what lessons do I take from what we heard this evening that's gonna inform my work in conservation, but also I think how I live my life or how I should live my life more generally. So I wanna step back from the details of tonight and talk about some of the values that I think are really important in what Chief Anase and, and, and Matt have told us this evening. So one, where I wanna start off is with generosity of spirit. Um, it was it certainly first and foremost, some, some people, obviously not Chief Anison, might have started off this evening by saying, look at the great work that I've done. Um, that wasn't his message at all. His message instead was, look at what we've done together. Uh, and I think there's a generosity of spirit there that I think is a very important value that we should use and inform our conservation work and also how we live our lives more generally. Um, also, uh, one, one of the other uh, one of the other features of the of, of the remarks tonight were just how how profound moments or crises, whether they're at the individual level or at the community level, how how they galvanize our opinion, how they galvanize action. So whether it was discovering and and keeling over from. Uh, an unknown substance in water, or whether it was the arrival of oil and gas in, in the Heizama area, these become sort of crucial catalysts to get our attention and to get our focus on taking action to try to make things better. Um, also, I think what I heard tonight was about the importance of cooperation, but also the limits of cooperation. Uh, and so one of the things that really struck me in comments this evening was to recognize that we have common interests and Cliff and James talked about that in the context of what does a park mean for the Dene Tha? And in that respect, we see it's important, but, but there's an important but. And, uh, and Chief Anase went back to it in Cheryl Bradley's question. And that is we have constitutionally guaranteed treaty rights and those treaty rights to hunt and fish and gather have to be, have to be respected. Uh, fourth point I wanted to make is about the importance of traditions and the importance of long held values and really how these aren't ancient dead letters. These are, these are opportunities to reinvigorate our own lives today by rediscovering and remembering and underlining their importance uh, and so we saw that sort of throughout the uh, throughout the video, for example. I mean, I think that was a that, that was a really important message there. And I was really struck by the comments of the young uh, member from the Dene Tha when he was talking about dreams, and he was talking about dreams, and and he referred to them in in two contexts. He talked about them historically. You know, we can we can remember what things were like. We can dream about thing how things were like but we can also dream about what the future looks like. And I would like to think that these values and these traditions are important at recognizing them and affirming them, whether in a settler's context or in a First Nations context, are important in contributing to better futures. Uh, I am hoping, for example, that the Kenny government is learning something about the importance of certain traditions and certain long held values with respect to places like the eastern slopes of the Rockies, and that's going to better inform decision making as we move ahead. And the last thing I'll say tonight to you is about reconciliation. Uh, and, and I've said this before, I don't know whether you've heard it or not, but other people have heard it before. And one of the things that really struck me when I was a prof at the U of A was how many times I heard university presidents uh, get up and do what we did this evening, and that is the land acknowledgement. You know, that we're acknowledging that we're on Treaty 6 or Treaty 7 or Treaty 8 or Treaty 8 land. What I want to see more of are substantive actions that support ideas like reconciliation. So that's why I think the IPCA idea is just fundamentally important if we're serious, if governments are serious about reconciliation with First Nations people. Then to my mind on the conservation front, this is a step that has to be taken. And when James says, you know, we're talking about curriculum at the U of A, yeah, let's have some curriculum at the U of A. Like instead of the University of Alberta president getting up there and saying how much 
you know, how, how much we appreciate the fact that we're on uh, Treaty, 6, Treaty 6 land. Uh, let's have some commitments from institutions with power like our universities to develop, cons to develop curriculum that's going to assist this process of reconciliation. So for my point, thank you very much, uh, James. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Matt, uh, for what you shared with us uh, this evening. It was, a, it was a, a very profound evening, and I appreciate what you had to say very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. We're going to pass off for some closing words from AWA President Jim Campbell. Jim, welcome. Sorry, Jim, you're currently on mute. Sorry. I didn't hear. Oh, right, there you sorry. are. Wonderful. Yes. You're on mute. Yes, the, the phrase of our lives these days. Um, so uh, it's uh, my privilege to kind of bring the evening to a close and uh, just uh, thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, and I want a particular couple of comments for me. We've heard that phrase on the land since time immemorial. And, and every time I think of that, I mean, I know that we all enjoy being out on the land and have an appreciation for nature, but for people like James and Matt, who are walking on land that their ancestors walked on, not just for hundreds, but thousands of years, um, I think that has got to be such a profound and, and sacred experience. And one of the pieces that uh, James mentioned was the idea of bringing um, naming back to naming uh, Dene names back to places. And I think if, when we talked about sustaining conservation and, and, and species, we also want to talk about sustaining language. And one of the best ways we can do to sustain language is to bring those place names back and make them part of our day-to-day -day vernacular. I think that could be such an important step to take. Um, so uh, James, uh, I just want to, on a personal level, thank you for the courage and integrity that you bring to your leadership that is so profoundly important, not just to your people, but to everyone across the province, across the country. And uh, it's uh, your friendship to AWA has meant a lot to us over many years. And, and I just want you to know how much we appreciate you and all you have brought to us. Uh, and Matt, it's, it's inspiring to have you as, a, I, I hate to say it, but the next generation coming along, uh, it gives us a sense along with people like Grace the, the sense that uh, the world is in good hands and we are moving in, in a good direction as, as difficult as it may be to see it sometimes. Um, I wanna thank, of course, Christiane and Vivian and Cliff and Grace and Sean behind the scenes and Ian for putting this, helping put this evening together. Uh, there's, there's always a lot of work to these things and we appreciate how smoothly you've made it go with all of us coming in from across the province. I think that's what we really enjoy about these, these events, as opposed to when we've done them at the AWA offices, is how readily we can all come together from every, every small town without having to travel. So that's been very positive and, and, and really well done. And uh, I certainly want to thank everybody that came here tonight. Uh, we really do appreciate uh, your support, uh, not just tonight, but for the AWA on an ongoing basis. Uh, it's uh, without you, uh, we cannot exist. So. It is, it is so important. And uh, I know we are living in challenging times, but I also think they're exciting times. As we've seen in the last few weeks, um, there is, I believe, a, a real growing understanding that uh, we cannot do to Mother Earth uh, indefinitely what we have done without seeing some very clear direct consequences on ourselves. And uh, our capacity in the last few weeks around the coal issue to mobilize people and build relationships very quickly. That's, that's the exciting part of this. What might have been in Vivian and Christiane's early days with the AWA, uh, a lonely standing on a blockade uh, and, and not getting much attention, uh, that quickly, uh, as we've seen with some of blockades and such across the country, that can quickly uh, happen across the country, around the world, in fact. And so that's a positive, that's a really positive development in my mind. Um, so again, I just wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, please do think about how you can support the AWA, whether it's through an adventure for wilderness or simply volunteering, supporting, but uh, your support is what makes it all happen. So thank you all for being here. 
So again, thank you, Chief, Chief James Anase, Matt Hanson, Munson, for being here. Uh, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you.